Your book tells us that we are entering a new epic, the age of AI, and yet the world seems eerily calm about this big transition. Do you think most people just don't understand the gravity of what is happening at this moment? We wrote the book because Precisely, we don't think people understand what this will do to society, both the good and the bad. And as a pro prologue, what I would tell you is most people, when we talk about AI, who are not computer scientists, think of it in terms of killer robots. And that is very much not what we're talking about. Uh, Dr. Kissinger talks a great deal about the transition from the age of faith to the age of reason hundreds of years ago where all of a sudden after the dark ages, the notion of us having our own ability to reason and think and have points of view and argue them was a new concept. It became the definition of what humans could do because no other animals couldn't do it. They couldn't reason through the situation. We believe that the development of these AI partners to call them something uh, will in fact usher a new age, an age of AI which will be both extraordinarily powerful, but also extraordinarily uncomfortable because we're not used to having as partners intelligence that's not human. Now, the potential, as you say, it's amazing and it's also terrifying. You have said that AI could help us better teach one million children. It could also tell us how to kill one million people. Should we be excited or should we be terrified? Well, I think the correct answer is both. And the reason you should be excited is, can you imagine solving the diseases that have bedeviled humans for thousands of years in the next decade or two because of the developments in AI and synthetic biology? Can you imagine the health benefits, the economic benefits of efficiency? The overall benefits from technology are well understood. The new companies, the wealth created, many of your viewers will want to be part of that. On the other hand, you should be terrified that these systems which are born around objective functions that are highly optimizable will be optimized for the wrong thing. I'll give you an example. You have a kid, the kid's best friend is one of these objects in the presence of a bear or a toy or something. And all of a sudden the toy gets the instruction from its maker that it should start hawking some product because there's an advertising thing. And all of a sudden you discover your kid is addicted to licorice because the bear told him to do it. I mean, these are the kind of scenarios, and that's a, intended to be a mild one, that we really have to think, how are we going to handle this? Are they going to require new forms of regulation? Is this something where the, the computer industry can get it right without regulation? But this is coming. It's also going to affect our national security and the way we do diplomacy, the way we run our elections, the way we deal with misinformation. I'm glad you mentioned children because as a parent, I want to know what this means for my kids and their kids. You talk about, uh, you know, talking to robots, learning from robots, befriending AI. Will our children prefer, prefer digital friends over real ones? And what are the consequences of that? Well, the general question is, are humans sufficiently malleable that they will ultimately decide that the digital friends and the digital world is more satisfying? Um, I don't know about you, you're a mom, you have uh, enormous responsibilities. Uh, raising a family is really hard. Wouldn't it be easy for you to just take, take the time off, put yourself an Oculus on and live in your metaverse and just have great fun, right? Will, will the arrival of these digital worlds and these digital partners cause us to re, essentially retrench into what we, it means to be human or will it change the definition of humanity in such a way it's not necessarily so good. Will it also change our conception of reality? For example, generative AI is becoming so much more common, AI poetry, AI writing, AI music, deep fakes. What are the consequences if, if, if the line between fake and real becomes indistinguishable? If we don't do anything, you're going to have this explosion of software, which will be open source, which will allow you to create disinformation and misinformation campaigns that are profoundly effective. And we know that exposure to even known falsehoods, especially if it's in video, can change behavior. So it's really important that we understand how far we want to take this. The technology is going to get to the point where you can have a massive misinformation or disinformation campaign and you can target individuals. And furthermore, the social networks, remember, are organized around revenue, more revenue from engagement, 
more engagement from outrage. So you have fake stuff, you have outrage and so forth. Are you surprised that people are not upset? You shouldn't be. The system is geared to produce this. Your book is calling for AI arms control. And I'm curious if you believe that AI is developing at a rate that it will get too far ahead of us. And could it become impossible to regulate? Um, I've thought a lot about this. You know, you could imagine a scenario where the AI, and this is just a, 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 an imagination, where the AI is both eventually becomes both general intelligence and it also begin, becomes able to write its own code. Now, this is science fiction today. Uh, a more reason, a, a shorter term statement would be that there's going to be the development of more general AI and these systems are going to be powerful and dangerous. An example is, as you said, you could ask the system, tell me how to kill a million people who are of a different race than me. And it might actually try to answer that question. Those systems are going to have to be protected and secured for the, be for the betterment of all of us. And furthermore, there are not going to be that many of them because they're going to be incredibly expensive to build. That's a proliferation problem. We're going to work in the same sense that Dr. Kissinger in the 1950s worked for, on nuclear proliferation. And he talks about how that was done. We need to actually now find a way to deal with and a dialogue and a set of principles around softer proliferation where the proliferation can hurt millions of people. And yet you say that AI is going to be harder to regulate than nuclear weapons. And we see just how hard it is to get any kind of law passed. And I wonder, are we going to see a new, an AI nuclear event, a Hiroshima or a Nagasaki, before we can come to agreement on these terms or realize the urgency of the need to do so? Uh, that is incredibly perceptive on your part. It seems to me that we want to avoid having to blow up the bomb in order to then regulate it. And so as we get closer and closer to these danger points, the one I mentioned, I'll give you another one. Um, if you go back to Dr. Strangelove, the movie, um, they had a, a situation where they had launch on warning. Um, they basically had a bomb that was guaranteed to take out the other side, even though the other side hadn't launched it in the first place. That's incredibly destabilizing. But now let me explain why we might end up in that situation. These systems, because of the compression of time, may have to make decisions faster than humans can. And yet the systems are imprecise, they're not predictable, and they're still learning. I don't want to stake the future of the human race on a system that is that unreliable. We've got to come up with some limits uh, for some of these behaviors, in particular in terms of automatic response. Eric, you've got a chapter on global networks and talk about the influence that private companies have on users, populations bigger than countries, bigger than uh, governments and countries around the world. Do you think that companies like Google, like Facebook, have too much power? And if so, how should they be reined in? Well, I've never been in favor of regulation of the tech industry because the regulation is always either too soon or too late. What I would rather have is sort of proper industrial restraint and essentially the kind of well-managed corporations that I hope these companies will become. Um, looking at what's going on, it's clear that Facebook, for example, went a little too far on the revenue side and not enough on the judgment side. And you can see that from the Facebook uh, leaks that have been occurring. Um, the problem here is that most of the people who said, let's break these companies up, the breaking them up is not going to solve the problem. It's really an incentive issue for what they're trying to do. And I would tell you, in defense of these companies, the greatest export of America are our people and values through these companies. Because when Google shows up, for example, in an Arab country or in a, in a country, a developing country, it brings American values, American liberal values, in particular in the treatment of employees and so forth, to a place that doesn't have it. So be careful not to, to, to essentially kill the whole thing. Now, uh, we're going to get to Facebook, but I want to start with Google because your co-author, Henry Kissinger, you've shared that when you first met, he told you he was worried that Google would destroy the world. And now he that said it was a left... threat to He said it was a threat to humanity. <laughs> threat to humanity, OK. Now that you've left Google, I guess I, I wonder how you ponder that question. Do you believe that Google is a threat to humanity today? Um, I do not, and, and I didn't agree with him at the time. His concern, which he's expressed many times, is that a private company run even by the best of people 
is not where such extraordinary responsibility should lie. It should properly lie in the democracies or the non-democracies and their governments. And what we've seen since his visit 15 years ago or so is that governments are stepping up and they're pushing back on some of the things they don't like. Uh, many countries are quite uh, upset about American values and hegemony. So I think that the export of American values and then the sort of the, the globalization of the principles of the tech industry is on balance net positive, but there have been a number of cases where people overreached, the most recent being Facebook. Exactly, that was my next question. Do you think Facebook is a threat to humanity based on what we have learned, especially in the last well, few weeks? The disturbing thing is that people have said a long time ago that Facebook was doing this, uh, but people said, well, they didn't understand or they didn't measure it. And what we learned in, in those disclosures is that these companies, and Facebook in particular, knew what it was doing. And that's pretty concerning. And I'll tell you in general, uh, as I'm from this industry, that the tech companies know who their customers are, they know what they're doing. Internally, they may not release it to the public, but they do know. And so it's important for them to stand up and say, I'm proud of what we did and we did it for this reason. And then they should be appropriately reviewed by the constituencies. It's very, very easy to get confused as to what your goal is. Um, in, in my case, I was fortunate to work with Larry and Sergey, who really did have a higher principle mission at the, at the goal, and that really helped us. Now, Mark Zuckerberg is making this big bet on the metaverse. How big and all-encompassing do you think the metaverse will be, and do we really want Facebook to own that big a piece of it? Well, the metaverse, of course, is a term that was coined in 1992, and it means different things to different people. I believe what he is referring to is distributed and untrustworthy uh, networks that are cryptographically signed that are the next generation of web services. And he wants to build worlds that are interactive on top of that. I think that is a great goal. It's also not primarily products that they have built so far. There is a burgeoning set of startups which are busy building this as well. And I look forward to the competition between the Facebook model of a multiverse and the startups model of the multiverse. And by the way, that competition is how we all win, right? Typically, by the way, the incumbent is given quite a scare by the startups, and sometimes the startups grow into the next big company, and I look forward to some variant of that. Uh, well, let's talk about Google then. Do you think Google does or should have a play in this multiverse? And if not, what, what should and will the next big innovation be? I don't, I don't know how to speculate on Google's future because I'm not part of the management team anymore, uh, except I think it will do well. Uh, it's well run. Sundar is a fantastic uh, successor to me. Uh, I mean, look at the performance of the company on every measure. Uh, the Google model is different. Remember, it's information and search and question and answering and giving you better answers. Uh, my guess is that the leadership will be in other places in the multiverse, but I don't really know. I'd like to end then on TikTok because you talked about the upstarts that uh, are, 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 you know, uh, levying these challenges to the incumbents. TikTok has these, like many tech companies, these powerful algorithms that are very controversial. China uh, may well have uh, insight into these, these algorithms. And I I'm curious if you're concerned about the rising power of TikTok and what you make of it. Well, TikTok is super impressive. And uh, this group um, out of China figured out a way to build a new kind of entertainment. And they also developed a new AI algorithm. The traditional social network algorithms were focused on essentially who your friends are. And to summarize a complicated answer, uh, TikTok's algorithms use your preferences and the world you choose to live in as opposed to your friends to make similar recommendations. And they've done it super well. So now they're, they're really driving a new form of entertainment. That's really amazing. I don't mind that at all. What I do mind is that since it's a Chinese company, you can imagine that the Chinese government may start asking questions that in America we might think are inappropriate. So the Chinese co company might say, give me information about this person, or let's modify what you're doing for this political view. And I don't think that's a very good American value. That's got to get addressed. 30 seconds, Eric. Are you worried that China is outpacing the U.S. on innovation or not? Well, we, we know that China is outpacing in some markets, but not in all. America needs an innovation strategy to continue to be focused on synthetic biology, quantum AI, and so forth. 
lots of money, lots of investment, and we can win.